So whether the cause is back there in time or whether the cause is operating now at every moment or both, which Christian theology claims, in any case, there has to be a cause. Well, you look at the universe and you see an enormous row of dominoes. And maybe it's only from past to future and maybe it's present, doesn't matter which. You've got trillions and trillions of dominoes. If there's no first domino, if nothing pushed down the first domino, then the second domino couldn't fall, the third couldn't fall, and the fourth couldn't fall. Because time only works forward, not backwards. Time is a one-way street. So if the cause isn't working already, it can't produce the effect. If the match isn't hot, it's not going to burn the paper. If the water isn't wet, it's not going to get you wet when you jump in it. That's the way causality works. It's dependence or contingency. So you can't have an effect without a cause, <clears throat> and there's this chain of causes either stretching back into the past or stretching up at the present moment. If there's no first cause, if there's no absolutely first cause, no uncaused cause, then there couldn't be a second cause or a third cause or a fourth cause or anything else, and none of the dominoes would be falling down. But they are. Therefore, there's got to be a first cause, an eternal being that doesn't himself have a cause. So the child's question, if God made everything, who made God, is a stupid question. It misunderstands the meaning of the word God. God is the only being that doesn't need a cause, the only eternal being. Well, that's the first cause argument. And that's very abstract. Philosophers like it because philosophers like things that are very abstract. Uh, and of Aquinas's five famous ways of proving the existence of God, that's the essence of four of them. The other one is the argument from design. You might look at it this way. You might say, however they got here, things now exist. You exist. Your children exist. Your parents exist. Well, if it weren't for your parents, you wouldn't exist. And if it weren't for you, your children wouldn't exist. So existence is passed down the chain. Well, what could be passed down the chain if it didn't have an origin somewhere? Suppose I told you there's a book that I could give you that is guaranteed to make you rich, happy, and healthy for the rest of your life. Guaranteed, absolutely guaranteed. You'd like to have that book, OK? You want the book? OK. Uh, you can have it, but I first have to borrow it from my wife, so I don't have it. Oh, OK, well, borrow it from your wife. Well, she doesn't have it either. She has to borrow it from her neighbor. Oh, well, does the neighbor have it? No. She doesn't have it either. She has to borrow it from the librarian. Oh, it's in the library then. Well, no, it has to come from interlibrary loan. Where does it come from? Another library. Do they have it? No, they have to borrow it. Well, if nobody has it, nobody's ever going to get it. Well, think of existence as that book. Existence is right now being passed down the chain. So somebody must have had it in the first place. Otherwise, they couldn't have passed it down the chain. And what does it mean to have existence in the first place? It means to eternally exist, not to need a cause, not to have an origin. That's God. Now, that's a thin slice of God, and maybe this is a disappointing proof to you because you wanted to prove that God is love and that God is a trinity and that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and that God sent down his Son. Well, maybe you can't prove that much, but you can prove this much. It's the same God, even though it's just a thin slice of him. All right, that's basically the outer argument or the argument from nature. Paul also appeals to an inner argument, an argument from conscience. You know, he says, that the demands of morality are absolute. Conscience is hard as nails. Conscience is uncompromising. Your feelings, your opinions, your moral codes, your philosophies, they might be compromising, but conscience is uncompromising. The standard is perfect goodness, perfect righteousness. And of course, we know none of us fall, come up by that standard. But if we didn't use that standard, we couldn't make moral judgments. We do make moral judgments of ourselves and each other. Uh, to say, don't be judgmental is self-contradictory, because that's very judgmental. I judge you for being judgmental. 
Uh, of course we have to make moral judgments, and we do. Well, what's the standard that we use? And Edna, I mean, she may be a little better than you are. Is that the absolute standard? No, she's not perfect either. So you must be using an absolute standard. Was well, that real? Or did you just dream it up? Where did it come from? Well, maybe it just came from Aunt Edna. Well, then there's no validity to it. Well, maybe it came from great grandma. Well, that's not absolute validity. Well, we were just taught morality by our society. Is society infallible? Can you never criticize society? Is society God? Do you bow down in, in superstitious blind faith before society? Of course not. There'd be no progress if you did that. So where, where's your standard of morality? You know it in your heart. You know it by, by your conscience. Even the moral relativist, even somebody who says all morality is relative to, to how you feel and what society teaches you and who your parents were and what religious instruction you happen to have had when you were a little kid, there's no absolute morality at all. Even that person will always admit that there's one moral absolute, at least, conscience. Nobody admires somebody who deliberately violates their own conscience. Let's say A is a pacifist and their conscience tells them I will never go to war. And B is a militarist whose conscience tells them I have to go to war, this is a just war, I have to risk my life. The, both of them have a moral argument and they disagree radically with each other. All right, you observe those two people and if you're a relativist you say, well neither one is right, they're just going by their conscience. Ah yes, but suppose the pacifist deliberately violated his conscience and, and took up arms and went to war and killed somebody. Wouldn't you say it's a bad thing for the pacifist to do? Yeah. And what about the militarist who says war is a just and honorable thing? Suppose he goes AWOL. Uh, is that a just and honorable thing to do? No, he's violating his conscience. So everybody believes that there's at least one moral absolute. It's always wrong for anybody, for any reason at all, to deliberately violate their moral conscience. All right then, why is conscience an absolute? We've, we've established that it is, and that everybody agrees that it is. There's at least that one absolute. Maybe the Ten Commandments are an absolute. The relativist doesn't say so, but at least even the relativist says conscience is an absolute. Why? Where did conscience come from? In Edna? Society? Your parents? Are they absolute? Do you bow down as if conscience is a, a fallible source? Well, it's just natural selection. No, it's our genetic inheritance. Oh, you're bowing down before a pure accident? 